and we make green steel by using ammonia, or more precisely, by using the hydrogen that is bound inside of the ammonia. What is meant by green steel? Green steel means a product of lower carbon footprint, lower energy use, less byproducts, and higher efficiency when being made. The reduction of the carbon footprint of steelmaking, however, is by far the biggest and most essential and urgent target. The reason is shown here. We have a drastic increase of the global carbon dioxide emissions, and steel is the biggest contributor to it, with about 8% of all the global carbon dioxide emissions. Today, we produce about 2 tons of carbon dioxide for every ton of steel that is made. Why does steel have such a high carbon footprint? Where does it come from? This can be explained with the basic redox reaction behind steelmaking. Here you can see the actual mineral that is used as feedstock, that is Fe2O3, a mineral that is called hematite. And that is coal that has been turned into coke, which serves to provide the carbon for the redox reaction to make the pure iron. Let us next take a look at the underlying redox equation. Here you can see that the carbon monoxide is reacting with the Fe2O3, the hematite, to form carbon dioxide and pure iron. The fossil reductant carbon monoxide is provided by exposing the coke to hot oxygen, which is then forming first carbon dioxide, which goes through the so-called boudoir reaction to form carbon monoxide. And this is done for about 70% of the global steel production in the so-called blast furnace plus oxygen converter route. Some of the carbon during this process is partitioning into the iron, which then must be removed in the converter by blowing oxygen into it, which again produces carbon dioxide. Some of the underlying principles have recently been discussed by our group in a couple of open access papers, which you are welcome to read. So we produce about 1.9 billion tons of steel every year, and the question is, why do we need so much steel? The distribution of the market is shown here. And without going into all of the details, you can see that more than 50% is actually used in construction for making buildings around the globe. There are many more fields where steels are urgently needed, such as in power plants, for windmills, for safe infrastructures, and of course for transportation. We expect that this market will be further growing from the current 1.9 billion tons of steel produced per year to about 2.5 billion tons of steel produced by 2040. The key question is, how can science help to cut these staggering carbon dioxide emissions in the steel sector? One very promising approach is to replace the fossil carbon monoxide by hydrogen as a reductant provided the hydrogen comes from sustainable production. And this would mean that we also replace the redox product, namely carbon dioxide, which is the main greenhouse gas, by water. This can be realized in a process that is called direct reduction. In direct reduction, you expose solid oxides to hydrogen. At the top of a static shaft reactor, you are charging iron oxide feedstock material. Then you let the hot hydrogen, for instance from a syngas process or from electrolysis, into the reactor, which then is going through the redox equation I showed before, producing water instead of carbon dioxide. And this then would be assembled in a technology array shown here, where you have in the center this aggregate that I've just shown before. You charge the iron oxide plus the hydrogen as a carbon-free reductant, as you just saw in the animation before. And that is then producing a form of iron that is called sponge iron, that is a very porous iron material, and the porosity 
comes from the fact that you are losing the oxygen, with, which leaves a lot of space in the material behind. And that can be charged and melted, for instance, in the form of electric arc furnaces, again, which can make the process of steel making much greener when you use sustainable electrical energy to operate these electric arc furnaces. The question, however, is where does all that required green hydrogen come from? We talk maybe roughly as a lower bound about at least 250 million tons of hydrogen that would be required every year to run such processes. Currently, most of the hydrogen of the green hydrogen that is being produced comes through water splitting, an electrochemical process where at the cathode you produce the H2. And that is when the hydrogen is a green hydrogen product fueled by wind power, by solar energy, hydropower, and so on. And the typical customer industries are then shown here where steel could be one of them. The problem, however, with using hydrogen in industry is that the efforts and the energy you need to make it liquid for transport are very high. So you lose about 35% when cooling the hydrogen down to minus 253 degrees centigrade. And that means you lose 35% of its own inherent energy. And the transport might also be a safety issue because you need pipelines that do not undergo hydrogen embrittlement. So we thought that ammonia might be an interesting alternative to hydrogen. And again, more precisely, not an alternative, but a vector to transport the hydrogen in molecular chemical form. That has many advantages. One is, for instance, shown here that you don't need so much space to transport it. That means when you get the same energy transported from A to B, you need less space to transport it in the form of ammonia. Also, there are many well-established pathways for the transport of ammonia, as shown in this overview map of existing about 180 million ton transport pathways already now around the globe. We also have here a forecast for the total ammonia production towards 2050, which shows that we can expect a very strong increase of ammonia production. Ammonia is also very versatile. It's not only used as a vector, for instance, for green energy or green metallurgy, but it also is used, of course, as a fertilizer around the globe. That is how the ammonia molecule looks like. And here are the three hydrogen atoms that we aim to use in that redox equation that I've shown to you before. We have shown now in a paper that the process proceeds as an autocatalytic process where the ammonia releases the hydrogen without the use of a separate splitter, simply because of the heat that the metallurgical process provides. And that has shown to reduce the iron oxide at the same rate as using pure hydrogen in the first place. And the total energy costs associated with that are also lower. So the idea is shown here in an overview where you see that two processes essentially take place. One is the autocatalytic reaction that splits the ammonia into nitrogen and hydrogen. And the hydrogen, as I've just shown before, is then reducing the hematite iron oxide ore into iron and water. And that shows that even at lower cost, the use of ammonia could be a viable alternative to the use of hydrogen directly because of the high transport cost. Now, what is the kinetics? We see in this overview diagram that the use of ammonia, that is this red curve, reduces the iron oxide as, at the same rate as a direct use of hydrogen only. That means we have no loss in reaction kinetics. The next question is, what kind of steel do we get from ammonia-based direct reduction? This is a rather complex microstructure picture taken at micrometer resolution, as you can see from that size bar here, and it shows the distribution of the crystals in the S-reduced product. So the colored crystals that you see here are little grains with different orientation, with different alignment relative to the electron microscope it was taken in, and that shows you just the fine crystalline nature of the S reduced product. And that would be charged and liquefied in an electric arc furnace, for instance. However, when you look closer, you can also see that there's nitrogen in the material, as you see here. 
so that color code indicates these little droplets of the higher color intensity are indicating sites where we obviously did not just produce only iron, but an iron nitrogen compound that is called a nitrite. And when we look again a little bit closer and make a diffraction analysis with electron diffraction in the microscope, we can see that that volume fraction of the nitrites, shown here in green color, is actually quite high, up to 40%. That could be first seen as a disadvantage, but it turned out to be not, because if you charge that iron, iron nitride compound mixture into an electric arc furnace, which is liquefying this material, you get pure iron out because the nitrogen is leaving that melt due to its vapor pressure. That means it's evaporating from the liquid metal, and at the end, after liquefying, you get the pure iron. We also looked at this from an atomic perspective. This is an atom probe map where the individual color dots indicate the positions of different atoms. And we learned from that that actually we have a quite complex array of different nitrides, which is currently the subject of further research because it might be also good for other products. So in total, we see a scenario before us where we have an international trading system that could be based not only on hydrogen, but also in binding the hydrogen, for instance, from the water electrolysis, uh, through ammonia production in the form of ammonia that is then at low cost shipped through well-established harbors and ships and tanks and so on, and lorries to the respective customers, where the metallurgical customer, as we have shown with the steel industry being by far the biggest one, could be one of them. And that allows you to make completely green steel. I thank you very much for bearing with me and see you next time again.